Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Steffens um, and uh, I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre uh, for Entrepreneurship Research, uh, which um, I invite you to, to come and have a look at some of the materials we have there. So if you Google ACE QUT is the easiest way to, uh, to find it. Uh, and then that section down the bottom uh, has a, sec uh, a, uh, a set of publications that are orientated towards <laughs> policy and practice. Uh, and uh, there's a, a bunch of our materials, hard copy over there on the, on the table, uh, and that there's a, a range more than that. Uh, uh, but of course, they're all downloadable from, from that space. So um, um, sometime in the future, uh, ha have a browse through there. Um, of course, what we're talking about today is really trying to get a bit of a picture of exactly what entrepreneurship and particular firm startup activity is like in Australia. Uh, and to compare that with, with other parts of the world. Uh, it's, it's often, I think, thought that uh, in some ways Australia uh, doesn't do so well in the area of, uh, of entrepreneurship and, uh, and uh, uh, commercialization of technology, that we're really good at innovation and, and not so good uh, at uh, getting it out there into the marketplace. Uh, as you'll see, in, in many ways, that depiction is just not true when you look at the objective data. So what, what we want to do is to look at uh, uh, research-based data uh, that investigates this question. Um, why is this so important? Uh, if we look at some recent OECD data, and unfortunately uh, Australia isn't part of this study yet, but we will be very soon. Uh, and we'll, we'll be able to report on exactly what it looks like in Australia. But I'm pretty sure it's the same as the, the other developed uh, countries. So if we look at young SMEs as a group, they, they only account for 17% of jobs. But they, they contribute a whopping 42% of job creation. So this is the engine of job, job creation uh, in the economy in many ways. Uh, and they are, uh, you know, don't, don't think of it that they are these uh, firms that, that start up and, and fail quickly and, and therefore, uh, you know, balance out with uh, job destruction. Uh, they, they only account for 22% of, jo of job destruction as well. At the other end of the spectrum, entrepreneurship is pretty in, important for social welfare. Uh, all around the world, we see it as a, a mechanism for uh, alleviating poverty and disadvantage in various groups. Uh, and in Australia, you, know, you can think of the, the problem with youth unemployment, uh, our problem with uh, increasing retirement age, uh, disadvantaged groups like, uh, like our indigenous communities uh, and, immig Im and immigrants. All of those uh, can, of course, benefit uh, f in some way by um, fostering entrepreneurship. So, in general, um, I hope I'm preaching to the converted to a, to a sense that this is a, a pretty important topic. Uh, and what's important if we want to uh, foster this effectively is to really understand the state of play, where Australia uh, does well and where it doesn't do so well. So what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to look at a range of evidence that gives a picture of how Australia stacks up against other countries. I'm going to focus on our, uh, a study that we're part of called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Uh, but essentially what that gets at is what I would call the grassroots entrepreneurship. Uh, so, so really how many people that are at a, a general level in the population are involved in, in entrepreneurship and various attitudes towards it. What it possibly doesn't get at as well is the really pointy end. Uh, so, you know, really high growth technology firms, et cetera, uh, simply because they're so rare and not very uh, easy to pick up uh, in, in the kind of study that GEM is. So I'll look at some, some other indicators and also what GEM can tell us uh, about that end of the spectrum as well. Okay, so talking about GEM, uh, it is the, uh, the world's largest entrepreneurship study. Uh, so statistics there in 2013, uh, 197,000 individuals surveyed, uh, as well as 3,800 national experts. Uh, it, the coverage was uh, uh, 70 countries in, in that year. 
uh, and has uh, covered uh, over 100 since 1999. Uh, and that basically stacks up to, as it says there, 75% of the world population or 89% of GDP. So there's pretty good coverage of, of, of what's, what's happening. Uh, Australia's participation has, uh, uh, since 2010, been through, through QUT in our centre. Uh, and we conducted the survey in 2010, 11 and 14. I will say that it's been a frustration for us that we haven't been able to seek funding. Uh, so this is a blatant advertisement. Uh, we are looking for uh, some partners in, in this project so that we can continue this very important study, as, as I'll, I'll show. Uh, and bef earlier on, uh, uh, in previous times, Swinburne did, uh, did the study over a range of years. All right, so what does it do? So basically, the main part of the, the study does a uh, harmonized uh, survey of at least 2,000 individuals in each country. And from that, it's trying to find out uh, what, how much activity and, and what are attitudes towards entrepreneurship across the general population. OK, so up here on the diagram, over the left-hand side, it considers, considers everyone potential entrepreneurs. It looks at their attitudes uh, towards entrepreneurship and how they perceive opportunities, their own skills, uh, et cetera. Then it moves into people that are actually doing things. And this total entrepreneurship activity, TEA is a headline uh, figure that the GEM always reports. And I'll be talking about that a lot throughout the presentation. And it's made up of two groups, um, a group who are starting up their own businesses, so they're doing concrete things to start businesses, but they haven't yet got there. And another group that are owner-managers of relatively new businesses up to three and a half years. That's the main uh, group that we're going to be looking at, and we'll look at a variety of, of uh, profile of, of that group in particular. It also does look at owner-managers uh, of, of uh, more established businesses, uh, although we probably get uh, good, good take on that from, from other statistics and, dis, and uh, discontinued businesses as well. The important thing about this, this area of the economy is that a lot of these are not picked up in any kind of official statistics that, that uh, countries have. Uh, so they are pre the often pre the registration uh, of the firm and, uh, and in many cases uh, this activity is never registered. Uh, as any official firm that government statistics pick up. And even more importantly, those government statistics don't usually come out for a couple of years, uh, whereas you get, uh, well, as we talk about, we'll get the, the GEM data from this year in February, in February next year. Uh, so it's, I think, a, a leading indicator uh, for governments and policymakers about what the, uh, the state of entrepreneurship uh, is. Right, so what I'm mostly going to talk about today uh, is our 2011 study, which is sitting over on the table there. Uh, uh, unfortunately, as I said, we didn't participate in the next couple of years, and this year's data is just, well, literally hot off the press. Uh, I had a quick look at it, and uh, the main kind of things I'm going to talk about today from 2011 have con continued. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the main takeaways, if you like, are not outdated. Uh, but we, we, the actual data needs to be compared, of course, against all the other countries. Uh, and we won't uh, see that until uh, gen late January, early February next year. OK. But looking at what happens across the globe, what we see, first of all, is that entrepreneurship plays a de very different role depending on what kind of economic state of economic development the country is. So over on the left, we have uh, factor-driven economies, what we might call underdeveloped economies. In the middle, uh, developing economies. On the right, advanced economies. And you can see that the actual rates of entrepreneurship, defined as, as, as TEA, starting up new businesses, is actually higher uh, down towards the factor-driven and efficiency-driven in general on average. Uh, and that's because people are uh, what we call necessity entrepreneurs. They're forced into entrepreneurship because they have no other uh, work choices. Uh, so if you like, it's, it's you know, not the rosy kind of entrepreneur, but it's, it's important from the social welfare perspective that I talked about. Whereas over on the right, 
are, are those um, more advanced economies, don't worry about the, you know, which countries they are. We'll, we'll look at that uh, in a little bit more detail in a minute. But uh, you can see there's a range, uh, but it's generally a bit lower because there's less of that necessity base. But as you, as you can see by this graph, we compare those three levels of economic development. Uh, much less necessity-driven necessity in the innovation-driven economies uh, and much more op uh, opportunity-driven or improvement-driven uh, in, in those as well. Uh, this is always percentages of the population along the left-hand side. All right, so how does Australia stack up? And the bottom line is very, very well. Okay, so we're marginally behind the US, which is the leader in the... Uh, and the GEM study at the moment of the developed economy. So throughout the rest of the presentation, I'm only going to try and compare apples with apples. So this, this will only be the uh, developed uh, economies that we're comparing. Uh, and so, you know, we're a fraction over, uh, or I think it was 10.9% of the population, which is a big number. That's a lot of people involved in uh, entrepreneurial activities of, of some sort. Also, interesting to see how this tracks over time. So this is a busy slide, so I'll unpack it uh, in, a, uh, um, in a few ways. So first of all, this is that necessity side of entrepreneurship. So almost in advanced economies, the, the, you know, the bad uh, type of entrepreneurship. And obviously from 2006 to 2011, the red is the gem average, which includes those uh, undeveloped, less developed nations. So probably the blue bar is what we're looking at mostly, the innovation-driven economies on average. And the, uh, the full purple line is a comparison, I'm going to use it a lot, of the USA since it sort of tops the list and you know, is, is often considered, if you like, the bastion of, uh, of free enterprise and, and entrepreneurship, et cetera, and you know, does very well in a lot of ways. So you can see back when we... In 2006, when we collected the data, we were right on, on par with the US. Um, after the GFC, compared with the other developed economies, necessity entrepreneurship skyrocketed in the US. And that's not surprising because the GFC hit the US much earlier and uh, harder over this period. So necessity-based entrepreneurship, if you like the bad entrepreneurship, um, took a big hit in the US. So I would say that this, our figures here, much lower than the US, do suggest that we weathered the, uh, the economic crisis better than, than the US, as, as we know from other evidence. Uh, but this would have been really useful, and these missing data points would have been really useful for us to be able to track what was happening in our economy over that time uh, compared with the US and other nations. Uh, but interestingly, if we look at what happens on the, uh, uh, the opportunity-driven entrepreneurship, the US, you can see, took a huge dive after the GFC, but then rebounded reasonably quickly. It was only 2011 before things started to pick up again. You can see that our, our figures almost identically match the US. So in those sense, on the opportunity side, it seems like we're we're almost like a clone of what, what the, the US is doing. So you know, I, I think you know, it, it, this provides an interesting picture of what happens through economic cycles. The next thing I want to look at is explore the role of age and how age plays out in terms of, of entrepreneurship. And you can see that we have basically this general pattern in all areas of the world. So the um, to interpret this slide, it goes from youngest to oldest age brackets uh, in each group. And you can see that the young and the old are typically much lower than in, in the middle years, and it varies a little bit around the globe. Uh, and obviously in the you know, areas like sub Sahara Africa, where there's a lot of necessity entrepreneurship, the rates are higher. But it pretty well matches that pattern overall. If we compare Australia uh, with both the developed nations and the, the US, what you see is that we're really close to the US on most of the age brackets, 
but we fall, fall quite below on, on the youth. Okay, so we start to raise a, a little bit of a question of what's happening in, in the youth space in terms of entrepreneurs. Remember, left hand, uh, the vertical axis is always percentage of the population through here. But actually, when I digged a little bit deeper, it's, it's kind of good news. What is it? the opportunity-based entrepreneurship, taking away the necessity ones, uh, is almost identical to the US, even in the youth. Uh, so what it's actually showing is that youth unemployment and pushing them into entrepreneurship as, as, a, uh, as an alternative is higher in the US and the Australia than in Australia, and so that's uh, not such a big problem. But I'll come back to youth issues a little bit later in the presenta presentation. Um, also, another way of looking at um, this is male versus female. Uh, Australia does reasonably well. Uh, in terms of that balance, uh, but not as well as some other places. Uh, but it's, it's a reasonably inclusive uh, with the uh, difference between male and female, non-extreme, and as you can see, pretty much about the same as the US again. We'll, we'll keep coming back to that theme. Um, all right, so... The next thing we want to look at is, is how uh, attitudes towards entrepreneurship uh, vary in various places. So um, again, there's, there's a big difference depending on which part of, which part of economic development you come from. Uh, and so we're only going to compare again with the developed economies, which, so, uh, which, I, wanted, which I do here. So, Measures of, Gem measures a few things. Perceptions of uh, the, your, uh, the individual's perceived opportunity to create a business, their perceived capability to do so, and also the fear of failure. You can see that we do exceptionally well on the first two, but probably an area where we don't seem to stack up as well is on fear of failure. Uh, so that's the only cultural thing that I can identify that, that, that is possibly a, uh, a barrier. Uh, if we look at society attitudes and intention to start businesses, again, we stack up better. In particular, uh, media attention being positive towards entrepreneurship seems to be fairly good in Australia. Uh, so that, that's a nice thing. So again, everything looks pr pretty rosy apart from this one issue. Again, a packed, busy slide, so I'll just unpack this one. Um, as well as measuring independent entrepreneurship, that is becoming your own owner-manager, what GEM did uh, from 2011 was also measure people that within their business or corporation are engaged in, uh, if you like, entrepreneurial activities like business development, new product development and stuff like that. So you can think of this as corp a measure of corporate entrepreneurship. So the horizontal axis is that um, percentage of the population involved in independent entrepreneurship, and the vertical one is the percentage of the population involved in, uh, in corporate entrepreneurship. And we just sort of created a map of those. One of my colleagues was very excited when he saw this, that, uh, that Sweden uh, topped the list in terms of the uh, employee entrepreneurship. So uh, that seems to, to be a nice thing for Sweden. But looking at that, and I'm not sure whether you can actually read the countries very well, but that group there is Denmark, Belgium, Finland, Sweden, all in a nice little group there. Uh, now, that seems to me that they're all culturally similar in a similar part of the world, uh, so culture might be a bit of a driver of how things play out in terms of what happens in independent entrepreneurship versus uh, what happens in corporations. Uh, another thing that you notice is that Australia groups again, I'll keep coming back to this, right with the USA over here, just a little bit of average on the corporate stuff, but of course very high on the independent entrepreneurship. And uh, if anyone knows all the measures of culture like Hofstetter or, or Global uh, Cultural Index, etc., uh, we're very similar to the US. So it, this made us think that maybe there's some cultural drivers of this, and this is slight, oh, sorry, the wrong way. Slightly off topic, but I've done a bit of analysis of the drivers of, the, of 
those two types of things. So on the left, independent entrepreneurship. On the right, corporate entrepreneurship. And it turns out that a bunch of things here in the middle have the opposite signs. And so it's kind of they tend to have stuff done in organizations as opposed to uh, in, in, uh, in independent mode. If there's, uh, so gender is a, a lack of, uh, so a, a quality of gender in the society rather than strong male-female roles, institutional level collectivism, uh, and a, on the negative side, a performance orientation of individuals. Uh, so um, they seem to explain differences. Uncertainty, I put a question mark here. It didn't come up at all in our study and many others. There have been a couple where it does. The, the, you, you immediately think that uncertainty and avoidance is the main thing that's going to uh, deter people from going into entrepreneurship. But it just doesn't seem to. Uh, and there's a, there's a oh, I won't go into the range of uh, theoretical explanations for that at the moment. All right. So. With that background, what that was painting a picture of, I think, is that grassroots levels entrepreneurship is alive and well in Australia. Uh, you know, we, we, we do very well comparatively in terms of starting up businesses. But we often question whether there's you know, a, a bit of a gap at the high end. You know, we don't have you know, anything like a Google or something like that in Australia, so these rapid, high-tech, Startups are often portrayed as, as, uh, as missing in Australia. So I want to ex explore that aspect a bit more. So there's a f range of data that I'm going to use to look at this. Uh, this is a new innovative study um, which uh, tracks the number of self-made billionaires uh, in different countries. So this is a real pointy end of this stuff, right? Uh, and uh, so it looks at the Forbes one, 100, 1,000, list, whatever it is, uh, and, and basically sees how many from each nation as a percentage of GDP. Um, so Australia does OK by that measure, but not astonishingly well. But I think you'd, you'd admit that this is sort of really looking at that pointy end of entrepreneurship and, and see whether it occurs. And we don't do terribly. We don't do wonderfully. Another study I'm going to draw attention to, uh, which well, originally was from the Startup Genome Project and a publication by Deloitte a couple of years ago. Um, uh, in terms of doing solid comparisons, the way they collected their firms is shaky to actually compare numbers or anything like that. So basically it was self-enrollment on a, a, a web-based system to, to pick it up. So you, you, I, I want to take, with a little bit of a grain of salt, the, um, the, the findings out of this. But where I think you might be able to get a little bit of uh, insight from it, even if the, uh, you know, the numbers you couldn't compare, because it, we, we don't know how representative they are of the population, but you think so long as they got enough of the average kind of beasts in each location, then their trajectory uh, might be reasonably similar. So I'm hoping that that's true. And so they, they compared the percentage of companies that what they call get to scale, which is basically after the various stages of seed funding and, and really get, get some momentum. And, and there you can see that as a percentage of firms that succeed with that, um, we sit at around about half of Silicon Valley which I actually think is really good. I mean, you know, Silicon Valley is the uh, clearly the uh, you know most of my, you know uh, the outstanding place in, in the world. Um, where we don't fare as well <laughs> is in terms of how much capital is raised during that that stage, but no one else does. So this compares, you know, New York, and we're about the same as them, a little bit less, but not not too much different. So Silicon Valley is clearly the outlier on this. Uh, no one else can hope to create a Silicon Valley. It's path dependent. Maybe there'll be a new technology that is, you know, rises up in, in this and there'll be another something around the world somewhere. Uh, no, I don't know return on capital in that either. No. It's an interesting graph there that shows uh, pretty much was, uh, half the number of companies getting to scale billion. The Okay, good. <laughs> so, 
yeah, a, you know, lots of activity, a great place to be, but all right, I'm not familiar with those statistics, but yeah. All right. Um, what I decided to try next was to use another data set that we have, and we have one, one good comparison with that, which is in the US. Um, so this is our basically our Cool Z study. Um, how am I going for time? I can. Um, I have a little video that explains the study. Sorry for those of you who were here yesterday. This is a repeat, um, but this will give you a bit of a taste of what the. Oh. Hopefully. The Comprehensive Australian Study of Entrepreneurial Emergence, or CAUSI, is a research study that aims to uncover the factors that initiate, hinder and facilitate the process of creating a new business in Australia. With funding from the Australian Research Council, the Federal Department of Industry and business partners at the National Australia Bank and BDO, researchers screened over 30,000 households selected at random in order to identify representative samples of ongoing startup efforts and recently established businesses and then follow the development over time. The primary data set for CAUSE comprises 625 ongoing startups known as nascent firms and 559 recently established or young firms. In order to qualify for the study as a nascent firm, the respondents had to be a part owner of the business, report concrete and continuing actions towards starting the business in the past year, yet not have previously made monthly revenue greater than their expenses over six months to any year. To qualify as a young firm, Respondents should also be part owner of the business and must have experienced a period of at least six months during the last four years where monthly revenues exceeded expenses. Supplementary samples of high potential firms were also generated in both the nascent and young firm categories. These high potential firms were approached directly by the researchers. Apart from meeting the nascent or young firm criteria, the founders of high potential firms had to reach a certain threshold of education and experience. High potential firms typically had high growth aspirations and enhanced technological sophistication compared with those in the primary sample. There were 106 high potential nascent firms and 120 high potential young firms included in the CAUSE study. The data set was derived from four annual waves of interview from 2007 through until 2011, as well as a fifth and final follow-up interview, which focused on the outcomes achieved six years after commencement. As some firms cease to operate during the course of the research project, the number of cases interviewed over time decreased. Information was collected about the characteristics of the firm through each wave of the interview regarding the resources available to or invested in it, its strategies, actions and aspirations, and the outcomes it had achieved. The robust design of CAUSE-Z allowed researchers to follow both individual cases as they developed across the waves of data collection and to make comparisons between nascent and young firm cases. The comprehensive Australian study for entrepreneurial emergence has given researchers deep insights into why some startups fail and why others succeed. Furthermore, in-depth analysis from the study about the process of business creation in Australia has uncovered some important findings that provide policymakers, researchers, entrepreneurship educators and practitioners with knowledge that was previously unavailable. Okay, so just summarising that, um, it's the study is a little bit similar to GEM at the beginning, uh, but does, uh, in terms of its screening of the, the general population, uh, but it does a much larger, more comprehensive hit of you know, 30,000 screened to get a bigger number and follow them over time. Uh, and fortunately, roughly around the same time, a little bit off, so we can't make 100% comparisons, there was one of those, a PSED2, in the, in the US. So this is the comparison I'm going to make between uh, those two, two groups of firms. So 
For this high impact pointy end, of course, we don't pick up too many of those firms in this study, but we pick up some. And when we compare the Australia versus the US, uh, Australia performs much more strongly than that US cohort. So on average, uh, and you know, so these are the ones that got to 20 plus employees or 10 plus employees after three years, uh, more than a million revenue, more than half a million revenue. Um, pointy enough end at least, uh, then you know, what you see is a bigger population occurring in Australia than in the US. So that's you know, overall good news for us. There's also a range of indicators in the GEM study that allows us to compare what, with what happens uh, in other places. So here the blue um, bars are the average of the developed countries across the GEM study. Uh, the USA is red and Australia is green. And uh, so it looks at uh, three things. For those starting up new businesses, uh, how many have high aspirations, meaning more than, more than 20 employees after five years? How many have new products or entering new markets with uh, existing products? Uh, and how many uh, have a technology-based uh, or a new technology for the, for the business. So you can see for those first two measures, again, we do much better than average and approach the US in terms, of the, uh, in terms of percentage of the population. The one where we fall down on, though, definitely is new technology. Uh, so new technology startups don't seem to be as prevalent. I will caution that the numbers are pretty low there, and so there are kind of high error bars on those, those numbers because it's low percentages. But, but still, I think... Um, and when I drill down on those, um, one thing that happens though is that youth group that I highlighted earlier does consistently much more poorly than the rest of our population uh, compared with particularly the US. All right, so we do well on high aspirations everywhere, but not in youth. And we do well on the new product, but not in youth and also the, the, uh, the seniors, perhaps not not so great, but we uniformly do badly across the board in terms of t technology one. Okay, so that, that's the one that, that falls away. And that is consistent with some, some other data that came out of the Global, Competit uh, Global Innovation Index, I should say, uh, which, which came out recently. So overall, Australia does reasonably well on this, right? We're 17 out of 143 nations which is at least okay. I mean, you know, we'd like to be a bit better, but it's, it, it's reasonable. But look at our ranking on things that indicate technology sort of stuff. So 87 for com, uh, communications, computer and information services exported. Um, graduates in science and engineering, 73, ranked 73 in the world. Uh, and uh, high tech exports, um, 56. So that space, you know, the, the, this picture is creating, well, to me it's creating a picture that this space is possibly an area of weakness uh, in Australia. Uh, and one other thing that we can look at that feeds into this is the, the rates of venture capital. Um, again, I'll say that the numbers here are a little shaky. Uh, around the world, it's a little hard to say exactly what venture, everywhere, you know, what counts as venture capital. And also it's, it's a little uh, hard to generate to be sure that you're capturing it all, uh, and various people measure it in different ways and techniques. So, um, you know, a word of caution. But nonetheless, Australia seems to be well down the list uh, across the the OECD. So this comes from uh, OECD data, and even more importantly, okay. So this this graph shows. That the straight line is 2007 levels is 100% for each, each uh, country. Um, the dot is uh, 2009, and the blue bar is the most recent 2012. <coughs> okay, what you can see from there is that Australia is one of the most declining nations in terms of venture capital. Um, so it's disappearing. Okay, so, you know, in summary, what does all this mean that I've looked at? Um, so I'll reiterate, 
grassroots entrepreneurship in Australia is definitely alive and well, so that doesn't seem to be our issue. Um, I would infer from that, that that the general population has a reasonably good entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, this is both in terms of creating businesses and also growth oriented businesses. So, you know, at the, the gem level of data, we seem to stack up really well. That's not to say, of course, that aren't areas where we can improve. Um, the youth space, and particularly that they don't look so ambitious, uh, especially against that US data, and this fits with my own, so what I see in universities in the US versus here, where entrepreneurship is, uh, is, is thriving and a lot more prominent than it, than it is here, uh, and possibly even back into the schools uh, in, in terms of education, profiling, role models, etc. Um, so, you know, an area where we could think to, uh, uh, to at least investigate more deeply. Um, again, that fear of failure, that was the one indicator that seems to be not so great in terms of attitudes. Uh, I, you know, I think it's preliminary to say that's a problem, but we uh, something that could be looked at. Uh, and then that final thing about the real pointy end, uh, venture capital being a bit low and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, there's a few issues there. First, there's a chicken and the egg. Money comes to where there's a lot of activity and, and recycles, et cetera, and there's path dependency. So there's a whole lot of factors that, that come in, into that. But I also question, um, you know, in Australia, can we expect to do re really well when a whole lot of our economy is made up by agricultural and mining? Um, so as a percentage of GDP terms, uh, you know, can we expect those numbers uh, to be as good? And of course we can't because we have very slow, you know, very uh, large part of our economy are slow moving parts, uh, industries. Uh, and then if we look at that decline in VC, I've got no, no data on this, but I suspect that's due to the kind of bubble that there was around biotech and that falling off. Uh, and as a result, you know, that's a sectoral thing again that's, uh, that's a bit different. So um, the IT technology space seems, you know, all that data seems to say that that is a little bit uh, below par in Australia. Um, and then you can look at that in one of two ways. You know, then it's an opportunity to improve. Or uh, secondly, you can also look at it and say, well, actually, we're better off putting our money and eggs in other baskets. Uh, so I'll leave that as an open question and uh, certainly one that uh, policymakers uh, de debate. Um, so so uh, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Google AceQUT. Uh, if you want to get uh, more information uh, uh, and, and download our materials, etc. And in particular, if you want to get onto our mailing list uh, of various things, uh, k3.taylor, which is Karen at the back there, uh, we'll be delighted to get an email from you and we can, uh, can put you on the list. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs> and open to questions or comments. So, which the. Yep. Not that one. That one? Um, the interesting thing about this spot is that the overall numbers, regardless of Australia, USA, or the developed countries, you'll see that technology is only 1%. Um, so that, that's, yep, that's 1% of population, population, remember, not um, what, just, yeah, ad, that's 1% of the adult population, not of the percentage of firms, I'll just clarify what I'm that. Saying is those bars than the oh, absolutely. Yep. Um, also, um, Penny Smith has published some very interesting material on um, you know, the, 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 the relationship between production of um, technology versus technology absorption in the developing countries of OECD. Yep. And what he found was actually you actually get better dividends from technology absorption in production, except for a few countries like Korea and things like that. Um, so mm -hmm. Yes. I, I agree, which is why, you know, I went to a few range, but I would say that, where was, oh, I've gone the wrong way. God. Where was it? Sorry. 
that one. Sorry. There's the fact that we do so, so poorly on import-export of the whole technology space to, you know, doesn't put us in a great light on that front as well. But I, I totally agree, it's not all about new technology creation and, and startups necessarily. Yeah, even though that's, you know, an important component. Um, you know, my, I, I think, as I said, my takeaway primarily is that it's, it's a, a structural issue of our economy that is the main driver of, of most, most of these differences and that uh, probably if you, if you looked at, if you had enough data to look at individual verticals that I think we probably stack up reasonably well on where we participate, it's where we don't participate that is uh, the question or is issue. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. My anecdotal evidence, certainly in Brisbane, is that there's an awful lot of interest in social entrepreneurship. Does your study differentiate between commercial ventures or ventures for a social outcome? Um, it would cover both. Um, is there a so question in Gem? I think because I'm working at for a social impact, perhaps it's not considered an entrepreneur. Yeah, the. Um, yeah, the language, you're right, the language at the beginning when, when it's screened, um, they may or may not include a social venture. Uh, and, and that, of course, could vary across nations as well. Because it... so we're seeing a growth in social entrepreneurship yep. interest in Brisbane, massive growth in that 20 to 26-year-old age group, mm -hmm. and also, again, in females particularly, between the ages of late 40s and mid-50s. Yep. So... Um, which could also mean that the 2014 data might show a slightly different pattern. Yes, Pear. I, I haven't heard my own voice for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Self-awareness is a good thing. <laughs> Okay, so that that perplexing issue around uh, um, uncertainty um, or anti-uncertainty dri uh, not driving uh, down entrepreneurial rates has been theorised that that's because um, in, in those countries more happens in uh, in, in normal employment. Uh, and then people are therefore happier to, who are entrepreneurial in nature, are happier to stay in their, their jobs rather than being forced out into, you know, to do something innovative to uh, start up their own ventures. So. <laughs> they, they, they are not <laughs> They're less stupid. <laughs> 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 
people. The deep learning venture capital, I would like to interpret that as showing that we are uh, the emerging world leaders in lean startups, but I think <laughs> that is the correct, correct interpretation. Then I, so, something that was worrying that you didn't point out, if you take the page and technology thing, uh, <laughs> let me get find it in a more efficient way. <laughs> one of the greenish uh, curves, there. yeah, something like that. That one? Yes. Was that? Take a look, yeah. Um, that, that's the new technology TEA yeah, via age. Uh, a particularly big gap in the very important 35 to 44 year age group. Of yeah, I mean, I will caution with the error bars on this, but it does look like it's, a, and, and it's the same in the US too, which, um, you know, it gives more credibility to that real, not, not a statistical <coughs> artifact. Those two? Okay. <laughs> A comparison story from Germany, since that was <laughs> measured. So, uh, in Germany, at a at McDonald's, uh, once uh, you know, these are very youthful workers, absolutely no English at all, uh, and uh, couldn't understand my attempt to to pronounce German. Uh, and, but the fun, the funnier uh, occurrence was was going to a hairdresser, and uh, they could not speak a word of of English, and my German's very poor, and so via <laughs> sign language describing how I wanted my hair cut, that was that was an interesting experience. But, so I yeah I think maybe there's there are some I think there are some cultural drivers in in that whole thing. <laughs> the fact that the cut so much like mentioned in Australia should should give us a, an edge in picking the best from from yeah, everywhere. Yeah. And to some to some extent, I think we do. We become a very seen. For example, we do a pop up barista shop at QT and invite the different uh, international students to come there. <laughs> All right, if there's no more questions, I'll call things to a close. And thanks, everyone. And uh, yeah, uh, come and enjoy some refreshments. <laughs> <laughs>